name's Kyle Worley, and I get the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Mosaic Church, and I'm delighted that you're worshiping with us. Whether you've joined us in person this Sunday, as we're going to do on the first Sundays of September, October, and November, or you're watching this online, or you're listening to it later, we're just delighted that you've worshiped with us. And let me tell you something that may seem really interesting, and it's certainly unconventional for Mosaic's far future, but is what we're doing this fall. There's only one sermon in the month of September. And there will only be one sermon in the month of October. Now, the reason for this is that a lot of times we hear a sermon and we don't do anything with it. But we wanted to create space over the course of this fall so that our church could slow down in order that we could go deep with God and one another so that we could come back stronger. And that requires practice, implementation, and transformation. And so this, what you'll hear today, is our one sermon for the whole month of September. You may listen to it or watch it once. You may come back to it a couple of times. But the hope is that you'll really internalize it, and then you'll look to practice it. And one of the principal ways you could practice it would be by using the guide we've provided for other Sundays in the month of September. This guide has Sunday times that you can use to structure Sabbath rest, which is our focus for September, worship on those Sundays. It has it for families, for just an individual or an adult, for couples, for a GC or a small group or a community group, or for you to do with friends, neighbors, roommates, whoever. And it also has some prayer prompts for the month in it. You can find a digital copy of this guide at mosaicrichardson.com. We also mailed guides to many people's households over the course of the last couple of weeks. And so you can find a digital copy of it and it will walk you through how we're going to worship as a church family, even when there's no digital full-length service and we're not gathering in person. This hybrid approach is unconventional. It's not normative. It's not a philosophy of ministry change for Mosaic Church. It's just what we're doing this fall as a proactive and faithful response to the unique season that God has pla uh, placed us in. And we're, we'd be delighted for you to worship with us. These next Sundays uh, won't just be Sunday off from church, there'll be an opportunity for us to worship as a church family as we engage in Sabbath rest through these practices together. And so if you want more information about that, you can go to mosaicrichardson.com. If you're listening to this service later, maybe you're picking this up on the third week or the fourth week of the month because we told you to go back and listen to it, then we're encouraged that you're joining with us and we're delighted for you to continue to follow along with us as we walk through this fall together. Some other ways that you can be involved, specifically here in September and going into October. Registration for our Men and Women's Bible Study ends on September 9th, and so that date is coming up quickly, and so September 9th is the last day for you to register for our eight-week Men and Women's Bible Study through the Book of Ruth this fall. It starts on the week of September 15th. And we would be delighted for you to join in with us. It's an eight-week Bible study with both digital and in-person options. And it's probably the most simple and accessible way to study the Bible this fall and to connect with other believers in your community. And so hundreds of you literally have signed up for this Bible study. And it's an incredible joy that we steward with great sobriety. But if you're looking for a simple way to study the Bible and to connect with other believers this fall, the Ruth Men and Women's Bible Study is your best option. And deadline is September 9th to register for that. Maybe you're looking to get involved in a gospel community. Those are our small groups. We have them scattered across Richardson. And if you're looking to get involved with them, then Gospel Community 101, a class, it's a one session class, is happening on Sunday, September 13th. You can register right off of the Mosaic Richardson website. You can go on Instagram or Facebook and also find the link, or you can email John McHell at mosaicrichardson.com, and he'd love to get you set up and get involved with one of our gospel communities here in Richardson. Last thing, if you've been coming to Mosaic and you've been wondering, hey, I, I would really love to step into membership, how do I do that? Well, we have a membership class on Sunday, October 4th. So that's the first Sunday in October, and there is a membership class that afternoon. It's two hours long. It's done digitally, so you'll be able to do it from your home, and you can find out what it means to be a member of Mosaic Church and how you can take the next step in membership here. So that's Sunday, October 4th, membership class at Mosaic Church. Listen, I am so exi excited that you've joined us in worship today. I truly believe that if we listen to God's word as it pertains to the history, the heart, and the hope of Sabbath rest, and if we walk in faithful steps, simple and ordinary as they may be, God will begin to transform our lives this fall together. Let me pray for us as we begin our worship together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the joy that it is to stop today to remember 
to rehearse and to retell the true story of the world, that you are a good God who has rescued your people and you still do that work today. We pray that you would bless this service and bless this day and our month in the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh. that you've joined us today as we worship together. Um, some of us are gathering in person this Sunday, uh, but I know a lot of you are gathering with us as we worship scattered apart still here in the life of this community. I'm glad that you've joined us wherever you've joined us today. If you want to open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, that's where we'll be at, but we are going to be bouncing around a little bit, but we'll make sure when we do to have the scripture on the screen beneath me as we skip around a little bit. But we'll be in Genesis 2, and this is a part as we go through the fall of our Comeback Stronger series. We'll have one sermon each month. On the first Sunday of that month, we'll meet in person, but we'll also release a digital service. And that sermon will really lay out kind of our theme for the month, what we believe God's heart is for the people of Mosaic and our community for that given month. And for September, it's Sabbath rest. 
Now, before we jump into this, I want you to think back and remember when you were a kid, right? When you're a kid, it's always about what we are going to do today. Everything is go, go, go. Let's grow up. Let's get up. Let's go out. Let's get out. You're always asking, how long until we get there? What are we going to do? You're yelling out, I'm bored. But have you ever watched a grown-up's face, an adult's face, when they tell you they have no plans on a given evening? No plans for a weekend? You see what happens? A huge smile starts to spread across their face. Why is this? What changes? Well, it's because we desperately want to rest, and it's really hard to do. Let me tell you something. It is hard work to stop the hustle. Byung Chul Han, he's a Korean philosopher, he wrote a fantastic short little book called The Burnout Society. And he says in this book, in the Western world, most people are too alive to die and too dead to live. Too alive to die and too dead to live. Let's be honest. Many of us have learned how to just live exhausted, anxious, afraid, shamed, frustrated, And it wasn't meant to be this way. God did not create the world so that humanity would constantly live at the pressure points of exhaustion, shame, anxiety, fear, and anger. God didn't create us to be that kind of people, but sin has broken us and it has broken the world. And our hope for this fall, as we think through Come Back Stronger, is that we might slow down so that we can go deep with God and one another so that we can come back stronger from this. And part of how we do this, an integral part to how we do this, is Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest. And I am convinced that there are few things more countercultural than Sabbath rest. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, he says, people who Sabbath live all seven days differently. People who Sabbath live all seven days differently. And and I have found that to be true in my own life as over the last two years, I have fought and worked hard to recover what it means to practice Sabbath rest. And I want to share with you the history and the heart of Sabbath. And why? Why is this so crucial? Well, to remix the great African bishop and pastor, Augustine, we will be restless until we have found rest with God. So I'm going to read Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord, and it's an invitation for you to give thanks and to say, thanks be to God. Let me read Genesis 2 for us. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, it comes on the heels of Genesis chapter 1, which is the first chapter in the first book of the Bible detailing the creation of the world, giving this account of the world being created in six days. And the first Sabbath, this seventh day, was a day that was supposed to have no end. This seventh day was supposed to be unending. It was supposed to be what life was like all the time. God's people living in God's presence, in God's place, reflecting God's purposes. You see, God had created the world. He had filled the world. He had created Adam and Eve. He had created man and woman. He had placed them in the garden. He had told them to be fruitful and multiply, cultivate and subdue. So he had given them their calling. And he said, take this place and extend it over the course of the whole world. And the seventh day comes and on it, God rest and invites his creation into delighting rest and presence with him. You see, the seventh day was never supposed to end. It was supposed to be what life was like all the time. And if you don't believe me, well, you can see that there's a very clearly defined pattern in Genesis 1. We're not going to go through each verse, but what you'll see in Genesis 1 is this rhythm. It's a refrain. It happens on every other day but the seventh day. It says something like this. God created and ends each day with this repeated pattern. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And you see this all through Genesis chapter 1. But when you get to Genesis 2, 
There is no, there was evening and there was morning. The seventh day. There's no end to the seventh day. Why is this? This is not merely something that the author leaves out. It's not something that God forgot to reveal. This is a deliberate omission. Because on the seventh day, there was supposed to be no end. It was supposed to be unbroken, unending, delighting fellowship with God forever, resting in his presence. That's how we were created to live. And this would include work. God had a task for Adam and Eve to do. So this Sabbath rest, this unending rest, it wasn't going to be merely static. It wasn't going to be boring, so to speak. It was going to be a different kind of activity. Not work to earn favor, but work on the foundation of favor. So it would include work. It would also include community life. It would include being fruitful and multiplying. It would include fellowship with others in the world and other created things in the world. It would also include growth. There was going to be development. There was going to be cultivation. There was going to be restoration and expansion. But it wasn't going to be expansion to gain and keep and hold. It was going to be the expansion of reflecting God's purposes in God's world. You see, God created the world to be marked by his people living their whole lives in his presence, reflecting his purposes in his place. This is why God created the world. We were created to be people who lived in the seventh day of rest with God forever. This was God's creative intent, but just one chapter later, In Genesis chapter 3, humanity rebels against God, rejecting his rule and reign on their own. You see, at the very beginning, God invites his people into unending, delighting Sabbath rest, seventh day rest with God forever. But instead of choosing rest under God's rule, they, humanity, and we in Adam and Eve, we chose restlessness through our own rule. And so often this is still the case. Instead of choosing rest under God's rule and reign, we choose the path of restlessness by attempting our own rule and reign. And it meant that God was going to have to be more specific with his people. What would it look like for them to practice Sabbath in the midst of a broken world and with the core of a broken heart? If they were going to be pursuing their own rule and reign because of sin, then how would God lead them in practicing Sabbath rest, which is submission to God's rule and reign? Well, we get a picture of that in the wilderness. You know, we've been looking with Israel between Egypt and Canaan and in Deuteronomy, a passage we looked at last week, we got a little bit of a glimpse of why God was calling his people to practice Sabbath. He's calling them to practice Sabbath so that they can remember a very specific story the true story of the world, the true story for Israel, and the true story for us. Look at Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15. It'll be on the screen beneath me. This is God. He's reminding Israel of his commands to them. The, the, the Ten Commandments, he's in Deuteronomy 5, he's retelling them and expanding them to a generation now wandering in the wilderness because they refuse to enter the promised land out of fear. And in chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, he reissues the call and the command to Sabbath. Look at what it says. He says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord God, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of the livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see, because of sin, we won't move towards Sabbath rest. Why? Well, because at the heart of sin is a willful determination that it's better if we rule and reign over everything. And if that's what your heart is determined to do, then you're going to be restless. And why is that? Because you can't rule and reign over everything. You can't control everything. You weren't created to be that. You are limited. You are finite. You have very clear boundaries. And when you try to go beyond those things, guess what happens? You become restless and overtaxed because you are trying to be the creator when you're merely creature. And Israel, like us, because of the brokenness of the world and the brokenness of sin, had been impacted in this way. 
They were intent on trying to do this. Their failure to enter the promised land in one respect is a failure to not remember the truth of Sabbath, which is that ultimately God rules and reigns over everything. It doesn't matter whether the inhabitants of the promised land are strong and mighty. We are the ones who have been rescued by Yahweh. So to not enter the promised land is merely a failure to remember that Israel's God is Yahweh, the one who has rescued them from Egypt and created the whole world. And Sabbath is a practice that defies and resists this sentiment in our heart that we have to rule and reign over everything. So God gives Sabbath as a commandment to the people of Israel. And he tells them, listen, the story of your history Your story, your rescue story, is intimately connected to Sabbath practice. He says, You shall remember on the Sabbath that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Why did he command them to keep the Sabbath day? So that there would be a day, a week, where they would be forced to rest to pause so that their attention and their mind could recount the true story of the world, could recount the true story of Israel, and that they could remember their rescue was not achieved by their own power, their own rule, their own reign, but by God. And this this privilege, this command, doesn't just extend to the people of Israel. I mean, God names creatures in here. He's like, don't let your animals work. Don't let servants work. He names sojourners in here. These are people who would have been a part of Israel, but not Israelite by birth. So he's even inviting the sojourner, the stranger, the traveler, the foreigner, the immigrant, the refugee into Sabbath rest. Why? So that they could get a glimpse of God's people remembering these things. You see, Sabbath, whether in the wilderness or the promised land, is to remember that you aren't in control, that the world doesn't revolve around you, to remember that you were a slave. Israel was a slave to Egypt, but for God's people today, we remember the greater reality and the greater truth, that we are born not to an Egyptian taskmaster, but to the prince of the power of the air, and that by nature we are broken by sin and we are chained slaves to unrighteousness. Righteousness, and that it is through Jesus Christ that God rescues us, a work we could never do on our own. And the Sabbath is a day that our minds are allowed the space to remember that story, to retell that story, to rehearse that story as we rest in God's presence, to remember that God rescued Israel and God has rescued me through his mighty acts in the world. You see, whether we think we need it or not, Sabbath is a time to remember that you are not God to set your sights on who he is and what he has done in the world and in your life. It's a time to restore ourselves, to tell the true story uh, in a sea of false stories. Uh, last week, my friend Daryl Dawson, he shared an article with me, This uh, and, he's, and the article was entitled, Why Science Says Boredom is Good for the Brain. Now, when we rest, we step away from distractions, and scientists and neurologists tell us that we ignite a network that's called the default mode. And the default mode allows our mind to step away from the rush and to kind of pan out a bit. And the writer of the article goes on to say this, and I thought this was incredibly insightful. It'll it'll be on the screen beneath me. Default mode is where we do something called autobiographical planning. We literally tell ourselves the story of us. We look back on our lives, the highs and the lows, and we build a narrative as to why we're sitting here right now, and then we forecast into the future. We look where we want to go, and then we figure out how to get there. But we can't tap this awesome brain power if we're always tapping our phones. You see what the author of this article is saying? That that there is actually a part of our createdness that needs rest, that needs stillness. For what reason? To recount to ourselves what's really happening. To kind of figure out what is going on in the world around me, and what's going on in my heart and mind. You see, this is one of those times when the witness of science correlates and corresponds with the witness of Scripture, that God knew and God knows that his people need to stop so that they can remember what story they are living in and what role they are called to play in it. Sabbath is like an eye test. 
It's covering up one eye and saying, can you read the lines? How far can you read? Is your vision clear? Do you see yourself clearly? Do you see God for who he is? Are you aware of the story that you're living in and the story that you're living out? And listen, this is not where Sabbath stops as a commandment. Because if we hear it merely as a commandment, we, we might miss the heart of God in giving it. Because the gospel takes what was a tyrant and makes it into a tutor. That's part of what the gospel does, is the, 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 that our sinful hearts rebel against the law of God. And so because of that, the good news of the gospel transforms us. We don't have to obey in order to earn God's favor. He's given his favor graciously and lavishly, and so on. So what? We obey. We obey in response to God's favor because we know there's wisdom in what God has called us to do. And in Luke 6, you get to see Jesus interacting about Sabbath. And I got to tell you, one thing that you will be surprised about is that most of the time, not most of the time, but often in Jesus's ministry, one of the fiercest accusations against Jesus is that he's breaking the Sabbath. Okay, It is a very regular occurrence in the gospel ministry of Jesus to find out that people were pretty hacked off that Jesus was not practicing Sabbath the right way. And yet in Luke 6, we get a great picture, not just of the history of Sabbath, but of God's heart for the Sabbath. And look at verses 6 through 11. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Look, I mean, they're like trying to trap Jesus on healing somebody on the Sabbath. I mean, you think that's crazy. But verse 8, but he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around, around at them, all he said to him was, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, in the verses just preceding this, they've already called Jesus out on Sabbath practice. And Jesus tells them, listen, the Son of Man, me, is Lord of the Sabbath. Listen, I rule and reign on the Sabbath. Sabbath is a demonstration that I rule over all things. You see, the religious practitioners of that day had so made Sabbath practice this law that it was no longer for restoration and healing. It was merely for observance and checking off tasks on a list. But when Jesus comes, God the Son incarnate, he becomes a tutor in the way of wisdom. He demonstrates to them, listen, you have made something into a tyrant that is really for your good. And Christ Jesus is constantly trying to reorient his critics to see that Sabbath is meant for restoring broken, thing, broken things. After telling some Pharisees that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, it says that he goes in, there's a man with a withered hand, he's there in the synagogue, and the man extends his hand, and it says the man's hand was restored. And the Pharisees are furious because in their view, Jesus is defying the law of Sabbath. But here's what they couldn't see. Jesus was embodying God's, God's heart for the Sabbath, which is restoration of the broken. Restoration of the broken. God has chosen to use Sabbath to restore broken things. And Jesus healing on the Sabbath or feeding on the Sabbath is a demonstration that the Sabbath day is not a law to be kept, but it is a day of rest that you are invited into. And it's a place where we know that God's world lines up with God's word. That God's wise ordering and instruction of the world demonstrates that rest is clearly healthy for us. It's healthy on almost every level for you to slow down and to rest on a weekly basis. And then we could talk about all of the benefits that are very tangible and very real about rest. What we might call the ordinary benefits of Sabbath. But I want to just break away, and I want you to see that in Luke 6, one of the things that's being demonstrated is that God has a way of taking the broken and twisted places of our lives and using Sabbath rest to bring them into alignment. By helping us to stop so that we can hear what is really true. By helping us to pause so that we might be released from the terrible burdens that we carry. By helping us to rest so that, we, so that he can demonstrate that he is God and that we are not. 
You know, there has to be times where we come into the presence of God and we remember and we rehearse and we retell. And as we do that, God restores us. You know, I grew up in a port community off the Gulf in Texas. And one of the things that we would do every once in a while is we would go down to the ports and to the docks and we would watch the big boats come in. And this is a dream for a little kid. I mean, these are huge boats from all over the world and they're coming in very close. And so you could be really close to these giant boats coming up these little rivers and these channels in order to refuel, to restock, to pick up something. And one of the things that you might often see if you were lucky is a boat coming into port in order to be restored, to be cleaned. And if you've never seen this, it's a fascinating process to watch. I mean, these boats are huge. I mean, they're just ginormous. And what would happen is they bring them into dock, and in a dry dock, they will lift them up so that they can clean the underside of this boat. Because if the hole, if the bottom of the boat is compromised, it's going to significantly compromise any journey that the boat is about to go on or has just come from. And some of these little holes could be very insignificant to our eye. But when you get up close to them, you realize, my goodness, there is work that needs to be done here. And there are barnacles, right, things that have kind of collected on the bottom of a boat that have to be cleaned off. They have to be taken off. And it's hard work. It's backbreaking labor to take this off and to clean the underside of these boats. But it's absolutely essential so that the boat can continue on in the journey. See, we need opportunities to step into a dry dock like that, to be lifted up out of what we're doing so that God can refresh, restore, repair, renew, so that we can enter back in on the journey that's in front of us, prepared to do so in a way that is whole, in a way that is complete, and in a way that is strong and enduring. You see, God's history of the Sabbath is significant. God's heart for the Sabbath is to restore broken things through rest. But listen, there is a future promise when it comes to Sabbath. You see that unending day of Genesis chapter 2, we hear about this unending day again. And I tell you this because I think it's important that you not just see that Sabbath is something that God it was inviting his people to in creation, that he was commanding his people to observe in the wilderness with Israel, or that he was embodying in the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it is a future hope for us. A future hope that is in Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to read this for us. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no more light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What do we find at the end of the story of Scripture? We find a new beginning. We find a new beginning in a restored world, a world made new by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 21, we had heard the beautiful promise that Jesus says, Behold, I am making all things new. And in Revelation 22, all things have been made new. And what do we find? We find a river of life. What do we find on either side of the river of life? The tree of life. This tree of life from the garden replanted in a renewed, restored, and remade world. The imagery here is that we have gone back to Eden. We are now in what God has intended us for, uh, for us to be in, for our, whole, for our whole life, for the whole life of the world. And then in Revelation 22, we hear that this new world will be marked by a new city. And what's there? It's the throne of God, the very presence of God. The very presence of God is there. And there is this promise. No longer, no longer will there be anything accursed. The ground will no longer fight back against our work. There will no longer be division between men and women. There will no longer be division between humanity. There will no longer be division against us and the world or us and God. We will be named with the name of God on our foreheads. And it says this, night will be no more. And there will be no need of a light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. What we're seeing here is a redeemed world with an unending Sabbath. There's no night on this 
seventh day with God forever. Rest with God forever will be the reality for God's people. It's a day with no darkness, real or spiritual, a day of delighting rest in the presence of God, an unending blessed day. That is what forever with God looks like. It's not clouds and harps and fat angels sitting around drinking and playing harps and singing songs. It is a remade, restored world where God is inviting us in to live our whole lives in his presence in a unending Sabbath rest with God. That is what heaven is. That is what forever with God is about. It is about Sabbath as it was intended forever. And so that is not just a motivation for us to consider what Sabbath means now. It's a motivation to practice Sabbath today so that we are limbered up and flexible for the forever Sabbath that we will enjoy with God. And I know it's countercultural. I know it's countercultural what we're doing to try to enter into practice Sabbath because Sabbath is an act of defiance and it's also an act of delight. It's a gospel act, one that says the good news of the world is that I am not God, but I know him. Sabbath is an act of resistance. It's saying, I will not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Sabbath is spiritual warfare. It's saying, I will not indulge and I will not overtax and I will not be burdened by Pharaoh's demands. Sabbath is spiritual renewal. Sabbath is to say, there is only one who can renew me. It is to say, I will be restless until I find my rest with God. If I work 70 hours this week and my boss gives me five stars on my report, I will be restless until I rest with God. If I have earned enough to keep me safe and sound for forever, I will be restless until I find my rest with God. If I parented my kids perfectly, I allowed the most minimal amount of screen time, all of their snacks were organic and gluten-free, and they did all their homework and aced all their assignments. Guess what? I will be restless until I find my rest with God. If all of my relationships are perfect and flawless, I have incredible amounts of discretionary income and time. You know what? You will be restless until you find your rest with God. If I have worked out and I, I have eaten well and I feel like I am strong and healthy, you know what? You will be restless until you find your rest with God. This is what Sabbath is about. It is not about us feeling like we have made the world in our own image, but it is about God remaking us in his own image. And here's the good news. Christ has made a way for us to rest with God. Because it doesn't matter whether you took one day off or 40 days off. If your heart has not come to a place of rest with God, then shame and sin and the burdens and brokenness of the world, it will keep your heart running at a thousand miles per hour, even if your day is completely empty and your schedule is free. Because Sabbath is a practicing of what salvation is the reality of. Salvation proclaims that we, broken sinners, strangers, and sojourners, have become sons and daughters because of God's great work in Jesus Christ. And by grace, through faith, we have come into Christ Jesus and are now at home with God forever. We won't be prepared to Sabbath until we have become acquainted with the Lord of Sabbath. Jesus Christ is inviting you to rest with God. He has done the great work of salvation. He has paid the debt of shame and sin, and he is in control of the cosmos. And if you surrender your life to him, then you are invited in to practice Sabbath rest so that every week you might have an opportunity to focus on the presence of the Lord, to enjoy the presence of God's good gifts around you while keeping your heart attuned to the call of, his, of him on your life and to the story that he has called you to participate in. So as we enter in to the attempt to practice Sabbath, I want to give you some encouragement on the foundation of the history of the Sabbath, God's heart for the Sabbath, our future hope of the Sabbath, and the gospel invitation that says you are free from debt, sin, and shame so that you can rest with God. I want to give you some practical wisdom as we land the plane here that you might practice Sabbath this month because that's what we're going to invite you to do. We're giving you the next couple of Sundays in this month, in September, to actually take what you've heard in the sermon today and translate it into action. Because I know a lot of times it's easy for us to just listen to a sermon, feel like, yeah, you know, that's probably right, and do nothing with it. And our heart for this fall was to take one sermon a month 
to give that to you and then give you practical instruction and guides around that so that you could begin to walk it out, so that information could turn into transformation. So as you look to the next couple of weeks on Sundays, we want to give you space to practice Sabbath. Let me give you some advice on how to do that. The first, make space to be with the Lord. It's not merely a day off. It's a day off from the things that are distracting so that you can have a day on to be with the Lord and to be with others. Make space to be with the Lord. Right now, today, as you're hearing this sermon or tomorrow when you're listening to it or whenever, look at next Sunday, talk with whoever's in your household, a roommate, a friend, a partner, people in your gospel community, your spouse, your kids, and say, from this time to this time, we are gonna spend time with the Lord. We provided a guide that you can find online at mosaicrichardson.com, and we also took the liberty of mailing hard copies of them to every one of your households. And so you can use that guide to frame that time, to give you some structure for what you can do in that space. So make time to be with the Lord. Do it with others. You can enjoy that time with yourself so spiritual renewal can happen between you and the Lord. You can also invite others into that, friends, roommates, your spouse, your kids, in order that you might engage in the presence of the Lord together. Walk slowly. That's a way that you can practice Sabbath next Sunday. Walk slowly. And I mean that like literally. I mean, just don't rush through your day. Do you have plans next Sunday? Cancel them. Cancel your plans. Say, hey, I'm really sorry we can't be there. I would have enjoyed to be there. If it is not vital, not urgent, cancel them. Just don't go. And let me tell you something. You know what canceled plans feels like? If you could bottle that up, they would sell every bottle out of the store, wouldn't they? You know you want to do it. You know you want this space to rest in the presence of God. You were created to do it. So God is inviting you in to do it. So next Sunday, walk slowly. Don't rush through the day. Pray. Pause to pray throughout the day. Maybe it's just a breath prayer. God, thank you that right now there is nothing to do. Maybe it's a breath prayer sitting out in your backyard. God, thank you that I have an opportunity to be here with you right now. God, thank you that I get to enjoy this meal with my family. Pause to pray, to celebrate who God is and what he has done. Laugh, play with friends or neighbors. I mean, just enjoy that time. Let it be slow. Sing a song loudly and badly if you need to. I mean, that's how I sing songs. So if you need to sing a song next Sunday, sing a song and you could sing it to a YouTube track or a Spotify track. Do what you need to do. Maybe you just sit around and sing it out loud in your living room and it sounds terrible and it's loud and your neighbors complain, but sing a song. Remember what God has done. Praise him. Look at people when you speak to them. Give them your attention. And as you do so, know this, that as much presence as you have given them, God's presence is even nearer, even closer than that. Go for a walk. Take a nap. Put your phone in a drawer and turn it off. Don't buy anything. Don't turn on screens. Stay away from social media. Cook a meal. Slow your day down. Be grateful. Hold things and hold them dearly. Look into the eyes of those you love and think, God loves me and God loves them. We're giving you some time the rest of these Sundays this month to worship as a church family by practicing Sabbath together. And it is us worshiping as a church family. The heart of our elders of this church and the call on this church is not to use Sundays as a Sunday where we don't have church, but to use Sundays as a a church, us worshiping together through practicing Sabbath. And I'm not just encouraging you to do this. I'm exhorting you to do this. I'm imploring you to do this. I'm appealing to you to do this because I truly believe that if you slow down and you use some of these Sundays this fall to slow down, to be with God, to be with others, that God will transform your life. I believe that because I have experienced it in my own. And my walk with God now is nearer and more intimate Why? Because there have been times regularly when I sit in his presence, when my family and I, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, will pray together and remember, this is who God is. This is what he has done. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace and mercy in Jesus. And we pray that as we enter into this month, you would use Sabbath rest to transform our lives and heart. That the information that we now know about Sabbath, the history of Sabbath, the heart of Sabbath, and the hope of Sabbath would be something that would form us as we go out and that it would move from information to transformation as we take 
faithful, simple, ordinary steps in faith, God, to practice what you have called us to walk in. We pray that on the foundation of the gospel that you have made rest with God possible because of the work of Christ Jesus, we would actually learn to be a people who enjoy that rest with you. We pray these things in the name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, <laughs> 
precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. We conclude our services with the benediction, which is really just a blessing. That's what the benediction is. It's a blessing. It's a sending blessing. And so we'll often say you can receive the benediction, which means to posture your body in a way that reflects the beliefs of your heart and the confession of the words of your mouth. And so you can read and receive the benediction. The words will be on the screen beneath me. God, you are better than the best we can find outside of you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, on the hardest days, we know that you are good. We believe, help our unbelief. Christ Jesus, as we look to you, fill our hearts with joy in your presence. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Walk in the Spirit, brothers and sisters. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now read with me. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Bless you. You are sent out in the name of the Lord.